So today I'm going to be looking a bit more in depth at the jQuery mobile framework, which is something that we touched briefly on last time. But since then I've had a bit of a chance to look into it. And I think it will be potentially quite useful for a lot of people. So I'm going to give a bit of an overview and some examples of the kinds of things that it can do for you. So essentially jQuery Mobile is a framework that provides you with a bunch of predefined functions and functionality optimized for working on mobile and touchscreen devices. Uh, it's it's not quite, uh, it's still sort of in beta or it's only, it's not quite reached its first stable release yet. So you may find some quirks and bugs with it still. But, uh, but on the whole it, it's quite solid so uh, I think it is something which you, you could potentially use for your, uh, for your web applications. Now uh, as I'm going through these examples, uh, just kind of remember that you you can use as much or as little of this as you want. So if you only see a few little things that, that might be useful for you as I'm demonstrating them, then you can still use it and whatever else you use, you can still use just plain HTML and CSS. Uh, so it's kind of a... <coughs> it's, a it's a kind of a... Take, take as much as you need approach and then just ignore the rest. <clears throat> um, let's see, the other things uh, about uh, the jQuery mobile framework is it's, it uses a lot of uh, HTML5 and CSS3 features uh, <clears throat> especially CSS3 when it comes to drawing its graphical elements so things like drop shadows and rounded corners. Uh, so that is doubly beneficial on the mobile because it uh, decreases the size of the files and then makes it work more quickly, uh, makes pages load more quickly. Um, and it also has graceful degradation built in. So if you use this, it will to some extent um, handle working on phones of different capabilities quite well. So that can save you time by, by not having to go and create uh, or, or consciously create different versions for different capability phones. So there are, there are some benefits of using it and while it is called jQuery Mobile and jQuery itself is a JavaScript framework You'll notice that in all the examples I'm doing today, I won't actually be writing a single line of my own JavaScript. So you get all of this powerful functionality for free and all you really have to do is define your HTML syntax in a certain way. So this is the jQuery mobile page, jQuerymobile.com. You can, uh, there's a link to download. Uh, the, the various files that you need. Basically you need three files. You need the jQuery library, then the jQuery mobile library, they're both JavaScript files, and then there's a jQuery mobile CSS file. Now you can download these all as a zip file if you want, or uh, as it says here, you can copy and paste this snippet here and it will actually load them from the jQuery's own website or their CDN content developer network. So similar similar to loading things from, from Google Code, for example. So that's what I'm that's what I'm gonna do with this example. Um, and I'm also going to direct you to this docs and demos page. Because a lot of what I'm going to show you today is based on what you can find here. And I obviously can't go through every single little detail, but I will give you an overview of, of pretty much everything or the things that I think would be most appropriate for what you need to do. Uh, but he here is where I would suggest referring back to if you want to look into anything in, in more detail. 
So there's a bit of an intro to jQuery Mobile which gives you the, the features, shows you what it does, and this site itself incidentally is built in jQuery Mobile. What I'm going to do is jump straight over to this component section and we're going to look at how we make a page in, in jQuery Mobile. So you see in this section anatomy of a page that the mobile page structure uh, looks like a standard HTML5 document. So I'm going to copy this and use this as the starting point for my first example. Now I'll say the same thing I said for the uh, examples I did last time. I'm going to demonstrate these. You don't need to follow along. If you'd rather just take notes, that's fine and I will upload the code for this. Um, but if you do want to follow along, you don't need anything fancy, Just uh, it's all just HTML and CSS. So I've got a folder set up here. Uh, the only things I have in it so far are an images folder which contains some images that I'm going to use later on in the examples. And I'm just going to create a new index.html file. And I'm going to paste this mobile page structure code over here like this and we'll just have a look at, at the structure of this. So you do need to use the HTML5 doc type for jQuery mobile because it, it uses some of the HTML5 features. Because you're most likely going to use this on a phone then it's a good idea to include the viewport meta tag so that it, it it zooms in and then we've got the three links the first one to the CSS file and the second one to the jQuery file and the third one to the jQuery mobile file so you'll notice that these are all being loaded remotely from this code.jquery.com site and if we go there in the browser you can see that it has a whole bunch of things here. So if you want to download the files individually, you can download them from here as well. Okay, and then I just have my regular body section for the HTML document uh, with some content in there. So I'm going to be previewing these in a couple of ways. I'm going to be looking at them in the desktop browser and I'll also look at these pages to demonstrate some things in the mobile safari simulator. So just to recap on why we need this viewport meta tag, if I take that out, okay, you'll notice that it's completely zoomed out. It looks too far away. So put that back in. Okay, and the viewport is much more suitable to a smaller screen. Okay, so once we've made sure we've included the the files that jQuery Mobile requires, now we can start to look at how we create the HTML structure for a jQuery mobile page. And the first thing that we do is we create a div and we give it an ID which will be the page name. So I'm going to call this one home. And we're going to give it an attribute which is called data-role. I'm going to set that to be equal to page. Now this data role attribute here is not a predefined HTML attribute. But what HTML5 allows us to do is we can add any custom attributes to any HTML element that we like and the only requirement to make sure that we keep it valid HTML5 is that we prefix it with the word data. So what you'll notice as we go through the examples that these data attributes 
are the main thing that the jQuery mobile framework relies on in order to apply all of its styling and all of its interactivity to your page without you having to write any of that or, or much of that JavaScript or CSS code. So what this will do is it will go through the various elements and we'll look for these various data attributes and then its JavaScript files will apply certain things. It will apply classes to make them style a particular way. Uh, it will you know, provide navigation links, all these other sort of things. So this will, you'll see more of these examples as we go on. Okay, so this first one, the data role equals page, is what we need to do in order to define this div as a logical page within our web application. So if we wanted to then define a second page, we could do the same thing. Div ID equals, let's say, page 2. Data role equals page. And if we put some content in here, Okay, what you will notice is that what's coming up in my web browser here is page one. Okay, so even though I've got two divs, it's only showing up page one. So this is important to understanding how jQuery mobile uh, sort of divvies up your pages is that it will you can define as many pages as you like, but it will only take the first one that you've defined the first div with the data role of page as the page that it will display first. Okay, so I'll show you how to use those other pages after, but let's look at the rest of how we set up a page. So each page you will generally have three different sections. The first one, and, and those are a header, content section, and a footer, just like you might normally have on any page. Now these we need to again define with custom data attributes and you can either define these as uh, div elements or you can also do what I'm going to do which is use the HTML5 elements. So I'm going to use header and I'm going to set the data role attribute to be equal to header. And inside that, I'm going to create a heading one, and I'll say page title. And what you'll notice over here is that it styled this header section in a particular way without me having to specify any CSS styles here. And if we go and inspect the style sheet, there's my header, you can see that it's got all of these classes applied to it which are ones that I haven't specifically said to apply to it. But what jQuery mobile has done is it has looked for this element with the uh, with the data role of header and it's gone and applied all of these header classes to it. So that's quite handy. It means it will apply all these styles for us and all we have to do is make sure we use these correct data attributes. If I remove that, okay, you'll notice that it just styles, it, it doesn't recognize those, those styles. So this is why we have to put these data attributes in is that's what jQuery Mobile is looking for. For you to tell it, I want you to style this in a particular way. And it has a bunch of these predefined default styles which are optimized for a mobile and a touch environment. So I'll add a couple more sections and then we'll talk more about those styles. So the next section I'm going to add is, again you could use a div, but I'm going to use the HTML5 article element and the data role is going to be equal to content. 
then I'll put a paragraph in there. This is some content. And you'll notice if I remove that data roll, it's a pretty subtle change here, but all it's doing is adding some padding. And finally, I'm going to use the footer HTML5 element with data roll equals footer. And let's put a heading in there just so that we can see it. Okay, so you can see that each of these sections has had predefined styles applied, and they are applied because I've used these data attributes. So I'll mention briefly the styles now, um, but we'll look more at them later. But essentially, there's various predefined themes or swatches that you can apply to uh, any of the various elements within your jQuery mobile page. So you can see that there's swatch A, which is a dark one, swatch B, which is blue, and then you've got a couple of gray and white ones, and then swatch E is yellow. So you can apply any of those themes to various different pages and elements, and then towards the end I'll show you how you can build upon these with your own ones. If you have a color scheme which isn't necessarily uh, supported by any of these predefined swatches, then you can reasonably easily create your own as well. Now the way that we assign what theme we want to use is really quite easy. So for example, let's go up to the, the div with the data roll of page up here for my first page and each element is going to have a default swatch. So I know the header element or the, the data roll header element, for example, has a default swatch of, of A, which is the first one. Um, because it's because it's styled dark like that. Now so each of these each of these swatches is defined by a letter. So you've got A, B, C, D, E. And they're supposed to be organized in order of their visual impact. So swatch A is meant to have the most visual impact and then so on and so forth. So the way that we can tell an element what theme we want to apply is by using the attribute data-theme and then we give it one of these letters. So I can say, I can give the whole page a data theme of A and then, then it will, for the background of that page, change, the, change it to that, that dark theme. I could make it B and it will change it to the B theme. I can, if I want it to be yellow, then I can change it to the theme E. Okay, and I can do the same thing for, for any of these other elements. So for example, maybe the header, I don't want it to be black, maybe I want it to be blue. So on the header, I'll set a data theme equal to D, which is the second theme, which is blue. And you can see that that's now styled uh, with that second theme, so we'll look more at we'll look more at these themes um, later on. But essentially, that's how that's how you apply a particular particular swatch or, or theme with the data theme attribute, and you can apply that to pretty much any element uh, throughout your interface. Okay, so I'll let's see. I'll set this one back to. C and leave that one as, as data theme B. So what we'll see again if we just inspect this quite quickly is the header, you'll notice amongst the classes that it's having been applied is now this UI hyphen bar hyphen B. So previously it would have been A. Okay, if I change that to A, now it's applying UI hyphen bar hyphen A. So that's sort of the the jQuery mobile working behind the scenes there, going, okay, you've applied this data theme attribute, so I'm going to go and apply these classes that I have. 
and it's getting those all from the uh, the style sheet. Okay, so we'll we'll leave the themes there for now. And let's look at how we actually use multiple pages. So as we saw before, I've defined these two pages, but all I can see is the first page. So let me change that heading to page one. And for page two, let's put in Let's just copy the header content and footer of that so that we've got something to look at. So I'll make that page two, and that's all I'll change. Okay, so change that text there. Okay, so how do we link between pages? Well, it's quite easy. All we really need to do is have a regular anchor tag, so an A with an href, and we want this to go to page two. So what we have to put in the href here depends on whether we're linking to a page within this file or an external page. So this is a page within the file because it's just defined in another div. So what we do is in the href we just type a hash and then the name of the ID of the data role page div that we want to link to. So I'm going to put hash page 2. And now I should be able to click on go to page 2 and you'll see that it does a nice transition it slides across and loads up page two for me. And then I can use the back button to go back to page one. Now, we don't always necessarily want to rely on the browser back button, uh, especially if we're going to be browsing as a full screen app. So what would be more useful is if we had a specific uh, back button link to, to click on to go back to our home page from here. So the way that we add that is I'm going to go down here to my page 2 div and I'm going to add oh, sneeze <laughs> um, I'm going to add a attribute called uh, data add back btn and I'm going to set that equal to true and what this should do now and I'll just refresh the page to make sure the changes take effect is when I click on go to page 2 you can see that it's automatically placed a nicely styled back button in the header toolbar for me. So I can click on that and it does the reverse transition and slides back to the home page. Okay now and I can add as many of these other divs here as I like. Um, but what I want to show you is the second way of uh, linking to another page and that's to define that page as uh, a separate HTML file. So what I'm going to do is create a new file here which I'll just call page3.html and I'm just going to I've got a shortcut here that will get me a new jQuery mobile basic template. So I've got here now on my page 3 a the div with my data role of page and while the ID here doesn't matter so much because I'm not navigating between pages within the one file I'm still going to give it an ID there and I'll call this page 3 and we'll say this is an external or well, this is a page from another file 
Okay, so if we preview this page is what it looks like. So I'll go back to my index page and I'll add a second link to my first page which links to that page 3 which is defined in a separate file. And this is quite simple again, all we do is simply link as if we were linking to it normally. So I'm going to go ahref equals page 3.html. So noticing that we don't use the hashtag, so if you're linking to an external file, it's just how you would link to it normally. We only use the hash and then the ID name if we're linking to an internal page. So I'll change this text to go to page 3. Okay, and now I should be able to go to page 2 still, and now I should be able to go to page 3. Again, it doesn't have a back button, so I will go into page 3 and add that data add back btn equals true to my page div. Refresh, go to page 3. There's my back button again. Now, what you'll notice, and this is not particularly evident on when I'm testing these files off my hard drive because it's so quick, but what you'll notice is that even though I'm linking to this page, it's not actually refreshing the, the browser page. It's sort of seamlessly loading in the content from that second page and then and then um, transitioning across to it. And that's really nice because it retains that native app feeling of where you don't sort of refresh and see a blank screen for a little while while it's loading the next page. Uh, and the way it does that is uh, by using Ajax to essentially go and retrieve this page. And the important thing to note is that it essentially ignores everything in your head section of your document except for the title page. All it does is it looks for the first div with the data roll of page within this file, grabs that bit of HTML code and then injects it into your page that you're linking to it from. So what that means is that you have to be careful when you're, if for example you're adding custom scripts or custom CSS to these other pages, then it won't necessarily be included if you're linking to that page from another page. So what you want to do is make sure that all of your styles and JavaScript and whatever else goes in your head section is all defined in the very first page of, uh, of your page sets. Okay, but functionally we really don't need to worry about much. It doesn't look any different to us whether we're loading a page defined in the same file or loading a page defined in a separate file. You will notice a difference if you look at, for example, on these doc sites, uh, if you navigate some of some of these things, then you'll notice if I click, I have to find one that I haven't clicked on before, Try opening it up maybe in like this. Okay, you'll notice that the first time you load, like each time you load a page, it will cache it. So the next time that you go to it will be instant. Okay, like that. But the first time I click on one, you'll notice the loading indicator show up. Okay, so it shows up, but it's still not it's still not blanking out and then loading the page like you like you would expect if you were clicking on an external link to another URL, for example. So that's quite nice because it, as I said, it, it, it gives that illusion of, of being able to navigate around more like a native application. Now what you will find is if, for example, I type this URL wrong, so say I say try and reference page 4 and that doesn't exist, then if I click on this, you'll see a pop-up which says error loading page. 
So again, it's not necessarily going to that new, it's not navigating to that new page, it's just um, trying to load the data. And if it can't load the data, it, uh, it stays on the, the same page that you're already on. Okay, now you'll also, you'll also be able to kind of notice this by how the URL up here changes as I navigate. If I click on go to page 2, so notice that it's, it's at index.html at the moment. When I go to page 2, okay, it doesn't change, it's still on index.html. When I go to page 3, actually I might need to demonstrate this in the proper browser. Save my files. Okay, so I'm in the I'm in the index page. If I click on go to page two, you'll see that the URL has the hash page two appended to it. This is good because this means that we can still bookmark that site or that particular page. So we can open up a new tab and we'll still go to that. And if we go to page three, sorry, let me fix the... Interesting, not sure why that's not working. Let's try this from the phone simulator. So you notice uh, if we look in here, all right, that it does indeed go and link to page three. So they're the two different ways of navigating. Uh, between pages with the jQuery mobile framework. So either, either you declare the pages as separate divs within the one file or you link to separate external files. And you can combine the two things, so I could have one link to an internal file and, and one link to an external file as demonstrated in this example. Okay, so we'll look more at page navigation a little bit later. Um, but let's start looking at some of the visual components that we can use. So I'm going to create a new file and we're going to have a look at uh, the button user interface element. So I'm going to call this file buttons.html and we'll start off with our blank template. Okay, so there is a section on buttons specifically. And so buttons are possibly the most common interface element that you might use. And they're particularly useful on mobile phones and, and touch phones in particular because uh, they're visibly bigger and they're easier to click than just clicking text links as we've done in this previous example. So jQuery Mobile provi provides some pre-styled buttons that, that you can style various elements as, uh, which, are, which are particularly suited to mobile and, and touch phones. So there's various different various different things that we can turn into a button. The first, the first way of creating a button is to just create a plain old link. So I can create an anchor with a, with a um, let's say a link to google.com and 
like that. So this is what it, this is what it looks like as a as a regular link. Okay, so it'll still link me to the Google website, but what I want to do is create a turn it into a interface element that's that's got a larger hit area and is easier to use on a on a touch phone. So I can quite easily do that to any anchor link by adding the uh, attribute data role equals button. Okay, and you'll notice it gets turned into a large, nice clickable button which has over and click styles and still works as a regular link. Okay, so it's got had all those things applied to it, and all you had to do was add the data role equals button. Incidentally, the order of these attributes doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you add them in the beginning, the end, or the middle. Um, it makes no difference. So that's one way of creating a button uh, with an anchor tag. The uh, another way is by using the HTML5 button element. Okay, and you'll notice that that by default gets styled as a jQuery mobile button even though I haven't had to specify the data role. And the third type is you can have an input button with type submit. Okay, and again, it will automatically style it for you. Okay, so the documentation shows a few other different types, which are just different variations on the uh, input element, but they're essentially the main ways that you'll want to create a button. Now, you can, of course, theme buttons. Buttons are themable, so any of these buttons I can set the data-theme attribute to be equal to a particular letter. So if I want that first one to be blue, and maybe I want this last one to be yellow, then I'll set the data-theme to be yellow. Okay, the next thing I want to look at is button icons. So jQuery Mobile actually has a bunch of built-in icons which you can use, and if none of them suit, you can use your own. But it's quite easy to add any of these icons to a button, and we do that by using the attribute data icon and then we give that attribute one of these names. So we've got things like left arrow, right arrow, you know, up, down, delete, minus, check, all of these different kind of icons. The names are all listed on this page here. So for example, I can set this first one to have a uh, left arrow by giving it an attribute of data icon equals and then arrow hyphen L. Okay, and you can see it's added the left icon arrow there. Started all nicely, haven't had to provide any other CSS. So I might just might just duplicate this a couple times. Okay, so I'll add that. So let's say we want to have, say, a back and a forward button. Then I can add the data 
icon balls arrow right okay and in the same way you can add uh, icons to any of these other things so let's add some more let's go to the Google button let's add data icon equals chat all right that might not be one sorry check uh, let's go to the HTML5 button data icon equals read and data icon equals okay so we've, we've got a bunch of different icons now for each of these buttons um, and you can also you can also add your own custom icons so for example let me add another button here and we'll go data roll equals button Okay, and let's say I've got a link called help. And I want to create my own help icon. Well, I've actually done that in my images. I've got a file called help.png. If you look at the documentation, it will tell you that to create custom icons, you need to create a white icon 18 by 18 pixels saved as a PNG 8 with alpha transparency. So that's what I've done, uh, and the way that we use our own custom icon is to use the same data icon attribute, but we set it equal to the name of one that's not already predefined. So here I'm going to say data icon equals help, and what this does now is it will expect me to now create some CSS classes which define that button with the background, my own custom background image. So you see up here it says to use custom icon, specify a data icon value that has a unique name, and the button plugin will generate a class by prefixing UI hyphen icon hyphen to the data icon value and apply it to the button. So what this means is that I need to go and create my own style and I could create it in a style um, style tags up here but as I mentioned before if I'm then loading this page into another one it won't necessarily load that so I'm going to create a my own style.css file and make sure I'm linking to that. Okay, which I already am. I've already put that in there. Linking style.css. And I'm going to create my style called UI-icon-help. Okay, so just to recap, it, it's expecting me to have a style called UI-icon and then whatever name I gave to my custom value for data icon. Okay, so that's why I'm calling it UI icon help and I'm using dot because it's a class. So I could do something as simple as making the background uh, red. Okay, and you can see now that it's styled, styled it like that. Um, I can override the default border radius if I want. So let's say I only want to make it two pixels, so it's not so circular. And but the main thing I guess I want to do is add the my own custom icon in. So I can do that by setting the background image to be URL and 
I've got my file in images slash help dot png. Images. All right, and so there you can see it now loads up my help icon, which is just a question mark. Um, and I may as well go and add the other one that I created. So I've created another icon, which is a shopping cart. Okay, so this will now be expecting me to have a style called UI-icon-shoppingcart. Just double check that. Yep, shopping underscore cart. Okay, and I'll style this to the background image of URL images slash shopping underscore cart dot png. Let's double check that it's there. Ah, did it again, sorry, thanks. Okay, so there it is, there's my little shopping cart trolley icon. Okay, so that's how you add your own custom icons uh, pretty easily. Alright, so and you can you can find all the other values for the pre-built in icons on the on the documentation here. So you can see see all of those ones. Okay, the next thing I want to look at is positioning of these icons. So for example, this forward button, to me it looks weird having the forward arrow on the left. I'd rather have it on the right. So I can change that by going to this link, which is a button, and setting the attribute data icon pos equals right. Okay, and it puts it over to the right. Now, I can just as easily, let's say I go down to this uh, Google one. I can also go data icon pos equals um, top. And the next one, I can also go data icon pos equals bottom. Okay, so we can place, but we can use the default placement of left, we can set it to right, top and bottom. We can also, let's say I just want a button which has just the icon without the, without the, the text then I can do that as well. So let's say I put this, um, let's say I put this help icon with just the icon and no text, then I use data hyphen icon pos equals no text. Okay, and it will just show the icon itself. Okay, so that's icon positioning. We can also, you'll notice that the buttons by default are all block level elements. So that is they take up um, the entire width and so nothing can, can go next to them. We can change these into inline elements. So let's say for example we want these top two buttons to be only as wide as is required by the icon and the text, then we can add uh, data inline equals true. OK, 
Okay, so you can see that first button now only takes up as much width as it needs, and if I add the same thing to the second button, okay, you'll see that it now they now both sit on the same line. So that's how we can have inline buttons. Now, the last thing I want to show you about buttons is we can we can apply something called a, con a control group, which when we do that, it will visually group them tighter so that they look like they belong to the same button set. So I'll do that first of all with, let's say, these bottom three buttons. And the way we do this is by wrapping those buttons in a div element. And we give an attribute of data hyphen role equals control group. Close off that div. Okay, and you can see how it's changed the styling so that they're all sort of joined together and then the top and bottom sections are rounded off like that. So that's 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 surrounding buttons within a div with a data role of control group. Now we can also do this with horizontal buttons, so I can do the same thing for let's say these top two buttons. So we'll grab those two buttons and put them within a control group div as well. Okay, and you'll see that the styling has changed, but it styled them expecting, obviously, that they're vertical. So what we need to do if we want to have a horizontal control group is add an extra attribute to this div called data type equals horizontal. Okay, and now they're grouped horizontally in their own control group. Okay, so that's essentially everything there is to know about buttons for jQuery Mobile. I will just add the back attribute to this page. so that when I load it from another page, it will go back. All right, so let's now move on from buttons and look at toolbars. So I'm going to create toolbars.html. And let's just set that heading. Toolbars. So toolbars essentially specify the header and the footer. And there's various different things we can do with these. Uh, if you're familiar with native applications, you'll often find that there's uh, navigation links uh, in the header and footer and so forth. We've already seen the back button goes there. And we can we can add our own uh, our own functions as well. But before I even do that, I just want to show you a couple of ways you can sort of align the toolbars. So I'll add some content. So I've got a few paragraphs there, so there's enough room to scroll. Now, I'll go up here to my header. Now, there's a few different ways that you can position the header and footer. The default is just to sort of be like it is there and, and scroll with the rest of the content. But we can also we can also define the header with an attribute of data position equals fixed. 
and what you'll notice there is as I scroll it moves along it disappears as I scroll and reappears at the top when I stop we can do the same thing for the footer as well easy to see if I size this window down okay so that's fixed header and footer that can be useful and there's also a variation on that there's also a variation on that where instead of data position equals fixed you can use data position equals full screen and what this is supposed to do is similar to similar to data position equals fixed but it's meant to have them only show once you've clicked the screen or touched the screen uh, it doesn't seem to work testing on desktop browsers because it doesn't have the touch event but I have tested it on my phone and so what happens is you won't see the toolbars until such time as you click and then they will show up. So it's similar to how some full screen interfaces will work on native applications on the phone. Uh, so for example, if you're browsing through photos, it will full screen the photos. And then to bring up the toolbars again, you actually have to tap on it. So that works like that, works like that um, with full screen. Though, as I said, uh, it only seems to work on the actual hardware itself. Okay, so... Alright, so there are various options for positioning the toolbars. Uh, we've already talked about uh, adding the back button. So, um, I won't necessarily go into that again, but we should for... Uh, Future use, add that data, add back btn equals true. Okay, again, this is only going to show up if I've navigated to this page from another jQuery mobile page. Okay, but what I really want to talk about is how we get our own custom buttons in the in the header, and that's actually really easy to do you'll find that if you put any links in the header that they automatically get styled as buttons without you even having to define the data role equals button. So we can for example we can for example um, let's say we want to make a, a home button so I want this to link back to my index.html and I want this to say home and let's say I add data icon equals home okay it will start like a normal button uh, I can theme it as usual data hyphen theme equals B and let's say again I just want to have the icon I can go data icon pause equals no text now if I add if I add two links then the first one goes on the left and the second one goes on the right so let's say I add a second link here alright there it is as I lick text, it goes on left and right. Now, if I want to change this order, I simply just change the order of these two links. Okay, but what happens if I just have one link and I want it to appear on the right-hand side? Well, I can do that by applying a class, and this is the first time I've applied a class rather than a data attribute. I'm going to apply a class to this A element and the class name I'll use is UI-BTN-Write. Okay, so that's how you can have a single button appear on the right. And if I click that, 
Okay, it takes me to my back to my index page. So that's how you can have sort of those global navigation links in your toolbar, which might be quite useful, even if it is just to have a, a button which links back to the home page. And footer buttons are a similar affair. Uh, I'm just going to copy and paste this bit of code because it's very similar to what we've already looked at. Alright, so here's my footer. Paste that in. And I'll add the Oops, back in. Okay, so now this is demonstrating how you can also add buttons to the footer. Uh, unlike the header, links in the footer won't automatically be styled as buttons because you may want to have just regular links in the footer as well. So all we've done is done, all I've done is what I did before in the the buttons example where I have uh, four links here and they each have a data role of button and they're surrounded in a div with a data role of control group and a data type of horizontal so that they display in a group and they each have different icons. And the only other thing is there's been a, another class added to the footer element, uh, and that's a class of UI bar, and that's just a simple formatting class to add some more padding to, uh, to a toolbar if you have controls in there which require more padding. We'll see if I remove this then that padding will disappear and they won't be aligned as nicely. So that UI-bar class is good if you're wanting to put buttons in your footer, for example. Okay. All right, now, navigation bars. Navigation bars are something that don't necessarily have to go in the toolbar, but the most common place you will probably have them is in the header and possibly the footer. Uh, so what we can do is, so I'll put this inside of my header div and I'm, again you could use a div or you could use the HTML5 nav element and actually before I do that, before, they, before I do that I'll just create um, I'll just create some uh, a list. So the way you would normally, the way that you would normally create a navigation list is just with an unordered list, and then list items, and then anchor tags inside of those. So let's do that, and then. Okay, and in this case, I will style them as buttons, so I'll set data roll equals button. Sorry, I won't do that. In this case, for the navigation, I'm going to apply, I'm going to apply class of equals UI hyphen BTN hyphen active. And we'll explain that in a moment. And I'll just create two more of these.
Alright, I'll get rid of that first. Let's go. Let's just create these three. Okay, so I've just got a list item here, regular list item. I'm just going to copy and paste this and create items two and three. Now, what I want to do to make this style as a nice horizontal navigation list is simply wrap this unordered list within a either a div or a nav element with data role equals navigation, oh sorry, equals nav bar. Alright, and you can see now that it's automatically styled the unordered list. So the the element that's data role of navbar expects underneath it to find a list with list items and it will take those and style them in a particular way. And then we can add the class of UI hyphen btn hyphen active so that we can highlight the active item if we want to do that as well okay so and this will just keep you can just keep adding items to this and it will keep including them and I believe after a certain point it might wrap onto another line okay so it will handle the layout of weird numbers of um, of items quite nicely for you. Okay, so I'll just chop that back to just those first three. Okay, so that's probably the handiest way of creating a navigation bar. Now, as I said, it doesn't have to go in the header. You can, you could copy and paste this into the content area, do a nav bar there, but Logically, from a user experience point of view, it most often makes sense to have it as part of the toolbar. Okay, so that's it for toolbars. What we'll look at now is some methods for laying out content within the page. So I'm going to look at something called content grids. So I'll create a new file called grids.html. Okay, now All right, so the, the idea behind a grid is similar to uh, any other sort of HTML grids that you may or may not be familiar with, but it's a way of providing predefined classes which allow you to easily lay out content in columns. And it's probably easiest if I show you the examples that we're trying to create. Okay, so things like this, so you might have, so we've looked at aligning buttons in line already, for example, but if I, if I create those buttons, And I add data inline equals true to both of them. Okay, you can see it looks all right when the screen's small, but as we get bigger, they they um, they still only take up the same amount of space. 
So what you may ra rather want to do instead is have them evenly distributed, so sort of take up half the screen or a third of the screen if there's three of them. So the way that we can do that is by using uh, various content grids. So what I'm going to do is around these buttons I'm going to create a div with a class of UI grid A and I'll explain this in a second. And Data inline. So I'm going to take this back just to my two buttons with no extra attributes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap each of these buttons now in a div with a class of UI hyphen block hyphen A the first one and the second one will be class calls UI hyphen block hyphen B Something's gone wrong there. So what this does now is it lays out the, um, it lays them out and it makes them fit within a grid. So it'll take up the total amount of space available to it within a particular grid. Now, the reason that these classes are written like this, it's always UI hyphen grid and then a letter to specify the type of grid. Essentially, the first type of grid is two columns, the second three columns, the third four columns. So therefore, UI grid A is two columns, B is three columns, C is four columns, and so on and so forth. And then underneath that, you need to have some container element with the class UI hyphen block, and then the letter, the letter defines which position in that grid it's going to take. So the first one's going to be A, the second one's going to be B, and if there's three, V, C, and then four, D, and so on and so forth. So if I change this grid to a type B grid, then it's going to be three, the grid's going to be three things wide, but I only have two elements. So if I want to use up all three spaces, then I should Add the third one there. Now, I'm not sure if you can actually force these to switch locations. No, looks like you can't. Okay, but what we could do, what we could do then is you could have you could have multiple um, multiple rows of a grid as well. 
So let's say you want to have a three column grid, but do you want to have rows of three columns, then you should just be able to add another three of these. All right, and rather than going UI block D, E, and F, which would be expecting the fourth, fifth, and sixth column, then you're starting back and going block A, B, and C again, so it knows to wrap around on, on the next line. So I'll change these for Okay, and you can do the same thing with any other elements. These could have been div elements or, or whatever else themselves. Okay, so the grids the grids are quite useful. It's probably probably easier if you just go through and look at this documentation page because it shows you the various different layouts. Um, but that's something that can be helpful for aligning content on the page. Okay, um, the next thing I want to look at is collapsible content. So I'll create collapsible.html. So collapsible content means this sort of thing. So if you have a lot of content, you've got a small screen, then it might be useful to provide sort of headings which you can then click on and reveal uh, information underneath. So this for example, so you've got a heading and you can click on it and that shows or hides the content underneath. So we can do that quite easily by creating in our content area So what we want to do is, I believe it expects you to have a heading, first of all. And then underneath, I think you can have um, pretty much anything. So I'll just go for a paragraph. Okay, and then you wrap that within a div with a data role equals collapsible. Okay, and you can see it automatically styles the heading in a sort of button with a plus icon you click on it, it reveals the information underneath it and changes that to a minus icon. So we can have multiples of these. Okay, and according to the documentation, you should be able to style both the header and the content separately, although this is something that I haven't managed to get to work, so I'm not sure if it's just a bug in the current version which needs to be fixed. But the idea behind that is you can apply uh, you can apply a regular data theme attribute to the collapsible div. So let's say we apply this one with theme A, that works fine. But you're also supposed to be able to apply a data content theme as well. And have the content styled separately as well. So it should look like something like this where it, the content underneath is styled sort of so it's visually connected to the header, but for whatever reason, the version that I'm using, it doesn't seem to work, but you can expect that that's something that will, will get fixed and will, will work. Now the only other addition to this that I really want to talk about is having these as sets. So similarly, 
similarly to how we can have button sets to group uh, like items if I just add another one of these maybe another couple we can also can also surround this entire thing in another div with a role with data role equals lap small set okay and again you can see it styles it so they're more visually connected Okay, um, alright, so that's collapsible sections. Uh, as I said, that can be useful when you've got a lot of content where you want to display overview but then provide quick access to the more detailed content as well. So that's like accordion components that you may have seen in other user interface examples. So that is collapsible content. Okay, the next section is forms. So I'll create a new file for that. Forms.html. So this is something which if your application has a lot of user input or user controls is something that can be quite useful. So the forms are pretty much the standard forms that exist in HTML anyway, it's just that jQuery Mobile styles them in such a way that again is particularly useful for mobile and, and touch context. So I'm going to copy and paste a lot of these examples because there's not really much new syntax. Uh, a lot of this happens automatically, but I'll just demonstrate the various different kinds of form elements. And you can see you can see these form elements if you have a look at the form element gallery on the docs. And so this is what they end up sort of looking like. So as you can see, nice big uh, touch and phone and mobile optimized controls. So I'll go through some of these examples. So, I might just copy this entire thing. Alright, so I'm going to copy a form div with a bunch of uh, with a bunch of form controls or form elements in it. So this form doesn't do anything, my action isn't posting it anywhere, this is just to demonstrate how it displays these various different form controls. So this first one is a standard select drop down menu and as you can see none of this none of this here really is any thing different than how you would write this in a normal HTML document. It's just the fact that jQuery Mobile recognizes these particular form elements and it will style them in a particular way for you. So this is the way it will style a drop-down element. Now the one jQuery Mobile specific attribute in here is this one called data native menu equals false which means that it will use its own styling for this pop-up menu here. Now if we set that to true, 
what you'll notice is that it pops up with the default browser implementation of that control which in this browser doesn't look like it would be very useful on a mobile so you might ask yourself why would you want to do that and the reason being that if we jump over to the phone simulator and look at forms then if we set the uh, use native menu to false then you can see it's using the, J the jQuery mobile menu but the reason you might want to set it to true is because most mobile browsers these days have good native implementations of the various controls so this is using the the phone browsers native controls it gets this sort of thing so you may determine that that's actually a more useful interface for you because the phone users used to selecting options with this interface uh, so that's why you can use the the data native menu attribute So I will set that back to false just so that it uses that style again. This next one down here is a it's a type of control which you only really see on touch on touch interfaces and particularly on touch phones. Uh, it's quite common to have on settings menus where there's a a toggle between two values. And again, you can see that there's simply just a label and a uh, and a select with two different options. Uh, but the select the select element has data role equals uh, slider set next to it and so the only requirements here is that you add that and that you just have two values and jQuery mobile will style it like this for you which works with both clicks and sort of touch drags now you'll also notice that each of these uh, sections is contained within a div with a data role of field contain and all that is is adding some extra padding and styling so that it keeps these form elements separated nicely and as you change the the size of the display so if you go from say a phone to a tablet that it keeps them laid out nicely so the documentation recommends that each of your form controls you surround within that div with a data role of field contain Okay, so moving on, we've got a slider which uses the uh, HTML5 input type equals range. Now normally the browser would style this just as something more like this with the sort of the up down things like this. But uh, jQuery takes that and also gives you this extra nice touch slider control here. There's the search input, which is a regular text search input, uh, and and if you specify the input type as search, jQuery Mobile will style it with this uh, magnifying glass for the search icon here and give you the nice cancel button. Uh, there's regular text input. Uh, there's text area input which is really not much different to how it normally is and then there's also the HTML5 uh, special input types again so you can add the input type email for example and if we look at this on the phone simulator then you can see that it gives us the particular keyboard for typing in email addresses Okay, and after that we have uh, radio buttons. Now radio buttons and checkboxes are something which really don't work well in their native native way on on smaller screens because they're they're quite small and hard to hard to click on. So jQuery Mobile here takes the regular radio button inputs and styles them with nice big buttons so that the click area is nice and large. There's also an example down here of horizontally styled radio buttons, which you can do like that, which again, uh, the only difference here being that uh, 
there's a data type of horizontal. And the last one here is a checkbox, and these last two are just to demonstrate the difference between a, the jQuery styled control and the native implementation of it. Uh, so these are essentially the same thing. This one, easy to click. This one, not easy to click. I can't even click on, on the label. I have to click on just the box itself. So the way that, so you can actually force the controls to, to show up without the jQuery mobile styling. And the way that it, the way that you do that with this last example here is to add data role equals none to the checkbox. Okay, and if you don't add anything, then by default it will automatically style a checkbox for you. Okay, so they're all the form elements, um, and they're quite easy to implement because mostly you don't have to even change anything or just recognize them and style them appropriately. Uh, you can apply themes to any of these and you can modify the themes so that they uh, appear differently if you don't like the rounded corners so they, they're still quite customizable. Okay so that is forms. Next we have Lists. Okay, so this is the last of the sort of the interface widget elements that I want to show. And possibly the one that you'll use most commonly. Uh, so I'll create a lists.html and create a new template. Okay, so okay again there's a whole section on list views which you can look at but essentially the way that you style a list nicely is by adding again a data role attribute of list view. So what I'll do first of all is create uh, my list. So I'll create a unordered list with some list items. Okay, so that's what it looks like as a regularly styled unordered list. So to turn it into a nice mobile touch friendly list, I add data hyphen roll equals list view. Okay, and it will display nicely like this. And if I have if I have links, okay, it will automatically add the right hand arrow. Right, even if I don't have them linking to anywhere. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can star the list slightly differently by giving it a data inset equals true. Okay, and then that will star the list sort of inset from the, the rest of it a bit more nicely. Um, my notes. Uh, okay, we can add, uh, you can add sublists quite easily. So let's say I want uh, these last three items to actually be a sublist, then I can create a, another list item here with
double check that syntax. Alright, that needs to go up there. Alright, so we can have a sub menu by simply having one of our list items have a, another unordered list within it and then having its own list items. And you'll see the way that it handles that is so this sub menu here, if I, you see it's just styling that first list item. If I click on it, then it will navigate across to uh, a sub-menu, just like that, and you should be able to nest them as, as deep as you want. So if you have quite deep navigation structure, then using sub-lists, sub-menus uh, might be quite useful. Okay, um, the next thing is adding... Have a look at. Uh, let's have a look at a uh, list view with thumbnails. So I'll remove that list. No, I won't. I'll do it in addition to. Okay, so. This example here now is list items with thumbnail images. So again, it's still an unordered list with a data role of list view, and I've got the data inset equal true again. Uh, but what I have is simply within the within the uh, anchor tag for my list item, uh, I've got a image. And I've linked to this image which I have, which is just of the QT logo, and it will take that and size it down to, I think it's 80 by 80 pixels, and you'll see that it's also applied some styling, so it's given it the rounded corners and so forth. We can also add uh, a heading and a paragraph to each list item, so that it styles like this. So if you want to have a sort of larger list display, which displays a bit more information, then then that style of list might be useful. Okay, the next one will be similar, but instead of large uh, images, we're going to use, um, we're going to style these as icon sized images. So add this list to the top. Okay, so these two list items here, uh, they still have the same image, but uh, I've given them a class of UI LI icon, which means it will size them down to 16 by 16 pixels. So they're essentially your two different sized uh, images when it comes to having a, a uh, an, an image in a in a list item. So whether you want sort of like a thumbnail or more of an icon thing, if you want an icon, you add the class of UI LI icon, and it will size it down to 16 by 16 pixels. Um, this one also demonstrates having a the count bubble over here. So the way that we add that in is again inside of the the anchor tag to have a, a span with a class of UI LI count. And then you put a number in, and it will put that number inside of the bubble. So that's quite useful. And you can have that. You can have that on any sort of list. So we can have this on the sort of larger list item as well. 
down here. So that might be useful for having, you know, sort of, um, you know, like like you have badges, which which, like you know, unread messages, that kind of thing. Little alerts like that. Um, so that's counter bubbles. We've also got this is a particularly useful type of list, this one here. Uh, this is a list with a filter view. And this is probably one of the examples where you get the most benefit for the least work. I'll put a heading in there so that it doesn't overflow. Okay, so I'm referring to this list from sort of here to here. And again, it's an unordered list with a role of list view. And what I've done is I've added this attribute data filter equals true. And what this does is it puts a search item in here and allows me to, in real time, filter the list results. So the classic example of this is if you have a contact list, okay, it will, as you type, filter down to just the results that uh, are relevant. The other thing that this example shows is uh, you can have list items with a data role of list divider, which sort of styles them as not necessarily list items but divider sections. So again, classic example being a contact list where you have you have the sections divided up by the uh, by the the letter index. So that's that could be a very very useful uh, list type, especially if you have a lot of uh, long data which you want to filter through and it does it all all in in real time so that's quite nice okay and then you have sub lists which I've already demonstrated so there you your various options for lists again you can theme any different number of these in a different way. Um, pick any particular item, let's say maybe you want to uh, make one of these lists sorry, wrong file Try maybe data theme equals a. Okay, so I can theme that just that particular list item. I can theme the entire list. Okay, so quite flexible in terms of theming as well. Okay, so that's essentially all of the uh, user interface elements kind of covered. Uh, as I said, there is more detail in the documentation, so if you're interested in this stuff, I'd suggest looking at that. What I want to go back to is looking at linking pages. Now that I've got some pages to link to, what I'm going to do is go back to my index page and sort of redo this so I'm linking to each of those other other pages that I've had. So bring this back across. So this is what it looks like when we left it. What I'm going to do is get rid of these two pages and I'll start those again. Okay, so, so create a new page, uh, I'll call this page jQuery mobile examples. And what I want to do is create a second page. I'm going to create an about page which I'm going to demonstrate linking to in a, in a slightly different way. So. 
this page I'm going to have an I I'm going to give an ID of about and I'm just going to copy and paste some content in here. So my about page is essentially just going to is just going to uh, say essentially what this does. It's just a small small example of some of the things you can do with jQuery Mobile. But I want to link to this page sort of differently to how I normally would. So what I'm going to do is in the first page, in the header, I'm going to create a link to that about page. And I'm going to give it a data icon of info, data icon of no text and class y btn right okay so this should link me to my about page this is what my about page looks like it just says here's some examples of various interface elements you can use with jQuery mobile and then it provides a link to the official documentation. So you'll see down here that uh, down here there's my paragraph, there's my button, so I've styled this link as a button by giving a data role of button and then I've just put an image in here just because I haven't demonstrated that yet but putting images in is no different how you would in any other web page. The one change I will make is to go to my style.css file and add a style to make all my images have a max width of 100%. And I need to make sure that including my style.css file. Okay, so now it nicely appears at 100% of the width. Okay, I'm going to add, go back again. Okay, so I've got the back button for the about page, but what I want to show you is a different type of page, which is not necessarily a transition to another page, but more what is like opening up a pop-up window, so what we would call a modal dialog. So the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to go to the link for this icon up here and I'm going to add the data-rel attribute and set that to equal dialog. And what this will do now is you'll see that it opens up, it starts slightly differently and the transition is a bit different. So it's more like having a pop-up window which you can then close rather than having a separate page which it navigates to. Now you'll notice that it slides back in. I really want it to sort of zoom back out rather. So this is where, uh, this is where page transitions come in handy. So there's this section uh, under pages and dialogues called page transitions which shows us the various type of things that we can do. There's a section on dialogues which tells us how to uh, open something as a dialogue and it tells you that its default uh, transition for a dialogue, so the default transition for a normal page is a slide, the default for a dialogue is uh, a pop and to make it both pop in and pop out, I'm going to add 
the data transition attribute to this link and I'll set that to pop and now it should pop in and also pop out. So that looks much more like a proper modal dialog now. So what I'm also going to add is uh, a list of uh, which demonstrates various different transitions. So I'm going to add a third page here. And this one's going to be called Transitions. And this will just be a, a landing page for my transitions. Okay, so we'll see if we can link to this first of all. Okay, so there's my transitions page. Now all I really want to do is set up a list just like I did before. So data role equals list view. And So we'll use Okay, so there's a list divider, and now I'm just going to create a bunch of list items with links to my transitions page with various different kinds of transitions. So they'll each have a data transition equals something. So if I go and look at the page transitions, the documentation, I can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six different transitions built in. So I'll copy this, paste it. Oops. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so I've got six list items, and so I've got slide, slide up, slide down, pop, fade, flip. Slide, slide up, slide down, pop, fade, flip. All right, and these are the same values that I'm going to give to the data transitions attribute to trigger each of these different kinds of transitions. So slide in there, slide up, slide down, pop, aid, flip. Okay, so now this can demonstrate all the different kind of transitions. So we've got our default slide transition. We've got slide up, slide down, pop, fade, okay, which just does a cross fade and flip.
which does a nice sort of three-dimensional flip along the y-axis. Now the one, it does have a star against flip on the documentation because it says that Android browsers don't support the, uh, the, the CSS3 transition, 3D transition yet for that, so it will sort of do a, do a cartwheel instead. Um, so just be aware of that if you want to specifically target Android that the flip transition may not work perfectly well yet. I'm sure it will soon enough though. And of course the, the pop transition, as we said, is the same one that works for the, the dialogue. Now I should just mention also with this, uh, with this page here I've got my only link, or I've got a link here to uh, an external file, in which case rather than loading that external site in via Ajax, it's going to just reload the page. So you will see a visible, visible page refresh if you link to an external site, um, but you would see that anyway, uh, even in a native app. So you can see this links now to the external site and you can navigate this just as you normally would have. All right, and the only other thing I'm going to add to this is a bunch of links to the various different pages that I've created. So Add these up here. All right, so now these all link to my other pages. I need looks like I need to go into forms and add data add back. Sometimes it's just a bit buggy trying to get it to reload, but that's not what I want. We'll just test the submenu on this list. Yep, still works. Okay, so there's a few back buttons and things I need to fix up with that. But now this has sort of unified all those together in a in its own little app. And I guess if I want, I could um, add the data inset back in. Okay, so that's now covered sort of all the interface elements and also navigation linking between pages. The only thing left to demonstrate is uh, how we create, modify our own, uh, our own swatches. So just to reiterate, you can apply a theme to lots of different elements. We can apply it to the page itself. Data theme equals Okay, we can apply one separately to the header. Data theme equals B. We can apply to list elements, to buttons, to the list themselves. So Okay, so there's lots of various different ways we can go about mixing and matching the themes. Um, but what I want to show you is if the theming, 
So let's just maybe have a look. So there's a link here about the theme framework and it shows you all the different elements that are themed. And basically, as I kind of mentioned before, all it does is it looks for this data theme and it looks for the letter there and then goes and applies uh, these various CSS styles uh, based on the, the theme that you've specified. So we can actually have a look at the the, the CSS file. So this is what the, the jQuery mobile CSS file looks like. It's a whole bunch of styles for all of those different items. But you can see the top section at least is split up into a bunch of different swatches. So you can see here the theme A and then it has all of these classes uh, with hyphen A added to the end of it. So all that really means that it's doing is it's taking the letter that you're specifying in that data theme attribute and it's going, okay, load me this particular element, hyphen, and then that letter. So there's no reason why we then can't go and create our own swatches. So probably the easiest way to do this is to copy one of them first of all. So I'll copy this, let's say I copy this swatch A and put it in our own style.css file. Alright, and the first thing I'm going to do is uh, rename this. So let's say I, I can just pick, a, pick an arbitrary letter, but one that hasn't been taken. So A, B, C, D, and E are already taken. So I can pick F. And what I want to do is go through and rename any of these styles that end in hyphen A. And the easiest way to do this is probably search for hyphen A space and replace that with hyphen F space, just so you don't accidentally overwrite some wrong things. And then you'll notice there's also ones here that end in a comma that we have to take care of as well. Okay, so place those ones. So we should probably go through and check that to make sure they have all been changed. And then all we need to do is modify these styles and then apply a data theme of the letter F. So I'll go back to my index page. And because these are in my style.css, which is being loaded here, then they, they, they will, it will know where to find them and, and they should be applied. So, I'll just do a very simple example and then I'll, I'll point you to a link which will go through it in more detail. Uh, okay, so this is, my, this is my index page. At the moment, my header is got the data theme of B, which is giving it this blue color. So what I'm going to do is change it to data theme of F and you'll notice that it's changed to black and that makes sense because we copied the A theme which is the black theme then it's loading this. We can, But I can be sure that it's loading my F theme by inspecting this and seeing that it has indeed applied a class of UI hyphen bar F and if I go here, it's telling me that it's finding that in my style.css file. So all I really have to do is modify those, those values. And so this is again where Firebug or the Element Inspector comes in very handy when you're sifting through trying to figure out what the exact style is that you want to, want to change. I go through, I want to change the background of this header. So I'm clicking on it, I'm looking over here, and it's telling me that it is a class called ui-bar-f, okay, amongst other things. So that, that will be the one that I go and look for first of all. And I can see that it's giving me a background color of hash 111, 
which is going to be dark, and it's also applying these, these background gradient images. So what I'm going to do is I actually want to emulate uh, this one here. If we look at the jQuery mobile uh, documentation website, you'll see that their header has also a class of ui-bar-f. Now the f swatch doesn't exist normally, so they've obviously gone and created it themselves. So what I can do is, uh, let's say I want to emulate this color, I'm going to take the, I'm just going to take these values for the background and the border colors, I'm going to go to my style.css page, and this is the style I'm interested in, ui-bar-f, I'll paste that over the background color, and I'll paste this border color or this border style over there. And and you'll notice you might be able to see that it has applied the green border, but for some reason, it's still the background is still appearing black, and it took me a little while to figure out why that was. But it actually has worked. Uh, if we inspect the element, if we inspect the header, we should be able to see. I might have to refresh this. Okay, we inspect the header, we can see that the, the border color and the background color have been set. Uh, but what's messing this up is it's also applying a linear gradient to the background, which seems to take precedence over the background color. So all I'm going to do is, I could go and modify those gradients, but the quicker way just to demonstrate that this has indeed worked is to just get rid of these background gradients and I preview now okay you can see that it's worked so when it comes to creating your own theme essentially you just want to go through figure out which components you are using and then use the component inspector to figure out the the name of the classes that are actually styling them and then go into your custom swatch and then modify the values um, as you see fit. And, and you don't just have to stick to the values here, you can add new ones, you could uh, import custom fonts, um, whatever you want, uh, it's, it should be super flexible. So the link that I said I would point you to which goes into that theming process in more detail is listed on the blog here under the jQuery mobile section, this uh, this Adobe link. Okay, so this essentially recommends the, the process that I just showed you, whereby you, you copy one of the existing swatches and then modifies them, uh, but it goes through in more detail about uh, what various classes uh, uh, styling so what 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 visual components uh, are linked to what visual classes and then the other section that obviously would be useful is the the theme framework section uh, which will show you all of the different elements that can be themed okay so I'll I'll leave you to perhaps look into that custom styling more on your own, but it's, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be too difficult. It shouldn't really be any more difficult than creating your own normal style sheet from scratch. Now, I'll just load this up again in the phone browser just to make sure that all of this works on the phone. Okay, so there's my dialog, there's my various list items, 
my transitions.